thanks for the introduction. Um, so my name's Andrew, and I work on this project called Binder, um, which is um, an open source project that's designed to make it really easy to share analyses that are in Jupyter Notebooks uh, really easily with one click um, on the internet. Um, and so all of this stuff that I've done, uh, I've done with, with Jeremy Freeman at this, uh, as part of his group, um, the Freeman Lab at the Genelia Research Campus. Um, and it's this really interesting uh, group that does sort of this cross between neuroscience and software development, software development directed towards um, you know, making it easier to do analyses for neuroscience and then share and visualize the results of those analyses. Um, and so having those goals makes it really cool because then we have this really dynamic group with researchers and software developers and some designers, and we get to work on all sorts of cool software projects. And I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, the other software projects, but, but only insofar as they kind of motivate uh, Binder. Um, so these three projects are all sort of firmly in the scientific Python space. Uh, the one on the far left is called Thunder, and the one on the far right is called Bolt. Uh, and they both are designed to make it easier to do distributed analysis of ND arrays in a way that's kind of invisible to the a user, so that a user doesn't really have to know about something like Spark or other distributed analysis engines. Um, and then the one in the center is called uh, uh, Lightning, which is a uh, visualization, uh, it's sort of like just like a really sleek visualization library uh, that's designed to work with multiple languages. Uh, but the one thing these all have in common that, that really is um, important to me is that they're all sort of built from the ground up to be used in some kind of an interactive document, uh, like a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and they also all have um, lots of documentation that would just be much better if it were interactive. Um, so, and, so that was at least the original idea uh, when it wasn't interactive, and we were thinking about kind of ways to achieve that. Uh, and just as a brief interlude, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about uh, uses this technology called Docker. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with Docker, you can basically just think of it as, as just a way of producing little reproducible environments, <clears throat> little kind of like file system snapshots that you then can spin up really quickly in a way that's more lightweight than, um, than creating a VM. Uh, so we were thinking about ways to try to create these interactive tutorials. And we came across, this was about a year ago, we came across this really cool project by uh, Kyle Kelly, who's a Jupyter contributor called Tempin B. Uh, and Tempin B basically does exactly that. You, you give it, you create a Docker image and you give the Docker image to Tempin B and it will spin up a bunch of containers for you. And then whenever a user sort of clicks a button in a browser, uh, they'll be redirected to just a pre-launched container instantly. Uh, so this is really cool, and we use this a lot for, um, for a bunch of, the, uh, of our software projects. Um, but there's this other side of the lab, too, that we're starting to think about. Um, that's the fact that we also spend a ton of time introducing scientists to open source tools. Um, and this kind of stems from the fact that you know, we'll all be sitting in the on-campus pub called Bob's, and people will be cycling through, and they'll see all the stickers on our laptop and be like, all right, those guys know some things about computers. And so they'll ask us about you know, better software development practices and just what to do with all their code and all their data. Um, and you know the suggestions kind of it, it depends on the group, but there are some things like across the board that we just always would find ourselves recommending. Um, and definitely those things are, are GitHub and Jupyter. Um, it's kind of hard to do anything without really good version control, and for reasons that you know you all know, Jupyter is really great for interactive analyses and just has so many uses that it, yeah, it's very standard. So we find ourselves recommending this to all the groups, and we kind of see this trend where lots of different groups on campus will start to use these open source tools and start to create interactive analyses and then put them in public places like on GitHub. Um, and so we were looking at you know, what we had done with our other software projects and these kind of interactive documentation things. And we sort of started thinking about scientific re reproducibility in general, given these kind of standard platforms that we were seeing being widely adopted among scientists on campus. So we're thinking, can, can this whole thing be made a little bit more general? Um, and also simple, because you know, by, by following these groups as they transition to open source tools, we kind of see the, the activation energy associated with each little change. And so we wanted to make something that would be really familiar to people that had already transitioned to these, these things. Um, and this was kind of the interface that we were shooting to achieve, uh, the important part being that little badge right there um, in the uh, readme. Uh, the idea is we really wanted it to, to be possible that if anybody just goes to any GitHub repo that contains analyses in Jupyter Notebooks and then some dependency file, they could just click this button and be you know, pop, popped into an environment that, uh, that where they can fully reproduce um, the notebook from start to finish. Um, so that's on the user end. But also on the, on the building end, we wanted that to be equally simple. Um, and so we wanted really that to just, you know, ideally we would just want it to be a box. We just want someone to put in a box with a repo name and give it to Binder, and Binder will produce an environment, and then anybody can come along and click it and run it um, right there in the browser. Um, and so now, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite crazy enough to do a demo right now at this point in the presentation, but I will just kind of do a little flipbook style kind of static demo just moving through, and then at the end, if there's time, we'll do a real demo. 
But uh, this is the main page for Binder. Uh, and this, this is the new main page. The old main page had a few other little boxes and things, but we wanted to simplify it and strip it down to just you know, the bare essentials. So now you just have a box and a few instructions, and you put in your GitHub repo into the box. And then you're dropped into a little status page that you know, will say that things are building. And you could follow the, uh, the Docker build logs to make sure nothing is going wrong right there. Um, and if all goes well and everything always goes well, then you'll see this green. Everything will turn green. Uh, and green means go. So then you can click the launch button right, right on the right. And you'll see a loading screen. And you sit there and you wait um, for what feels like an agonizingly long time if it's a demo. And then eventually, you're dropped into uh, a notebook. And you can run it from start to finish. Um, so that's kind of the workflow for Binder. That's what we're trying to do with it. Um, and now I just kind of want to go through each step, each one of those things, and just describe a little bit about what's happening, um, not in too much detail. Um, so Binder is really made up of just three components, three phases. Uh, the first phase is taking these repos and turning them into uh, Docker images. And the process for doing that is pretty straightforward. We just we look at the repo contents, and for dependency files that are known to Binder, like uh, in our case right now, we'll I'll talk about that in a second, actually. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but we'll look at the contents of the repo, and then we will, for each file that we find, we'll add a directive to this Docker file, which is a document that, like, that defines how to construct one of these reproducible environments in a, in a declarative way. Um, once we have the Docker file, then we'll build into an image and push it to one of our private registries that hosts the images so that we can really quickly pull them onto nodes and a compute cluster later. Um, just to give a little bit of info about this, uh, this, this build process, uh, right now it's very tailored to Python. So we handle explicitly um, requirements of TXT files and environment YAML files for pip and conda, respectively. Uh, and if you have these in your repo, Binder will know what to do with it and will know how to build an environment out of it. Uh, if you don't, uh, we also support cu the custom Docker file option. So you can use languages like R and Julia as well. Um, but uh, you know, we, tr we try to make it, you know, I ideally, there would not be a custom Docker file option. You know, ideally, Binder would kind of, you wouldn't have to be aware that Docker exists to use Binder. Um, but we haven't really been able to figure out a nice way to like, install system packages and also achieve that level of flexibility without something like a Docker file. So that's going to be supported for, for the near future. Um, and just to show why it's much nicer to use uh, a dependency file instead of a Docker file, this is just a, it's too small to read, I think. But this is just an example of a Docker file. It contains a lot of directives that def you know, tell you how to configure um, a file system with a bunch of dependencies. It's it's pretty you know it's it's not that hard to understand, but at the same time it's certainly not as simple as like a little environment YAML file that just declares the dependencies that you want and there it is. So you know naturally if we can the more stuff we can move into these dependency files the better. Um, and I just want to emphasize that this first stage, the build stage, it only depends on a uh, on a couple of uh, open source tools, um, just GitHub, Jupyter, and Docker, and everything that comes after this, all the deployment stuff, uh, it's all uh, a totally separate uh, part of Binder. Um, but the Docker image isn't quite enough. So when you actually want to take one of these Docker images and deploy it onto some container management system on a cluster, you need a little bit more metadata to define how to launch that image. Like say you want to have resource constraints or say you want to say that a certain container can't communicate with another container. This is all additional deployment metadata. So we have a second phase here that takes these images and turns them into templates that are then you know, considered to be deployable. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about this, but the reason why we have three circles there is because in the beta version of Binder, we allowed you to attach services to your containers, like a Spark Master and a Spark Worker, which would be in separate containers. And we found that was a little too cumbersome to, to maintain and to, we couldn't really think of a really good way to extend it. So we stripped that out for the 1.0 version that I'll talk about later. Um, but we're still sort of retaining the ability to do it later by having this, set, this template step. It gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, and so now when it comes to deployment, we can take these templates and uh, put them on some container manager. And for our purposes, we chose to use Kubernetes, but really you can use Docker Swarm or whatever you like. Um, and what this will do is this will manage the running container throughout its life cycle and then clean it up after like, a certain amount of inactivity. Um, and this is just a cartoon of, of that deployment process. Um, so now I want to get to the fun stuff, and I want to start going through some examples, um, because Binder's been around for about 10 months now, um, and, it's, and it's gotten a good amount of use. Um, so first off, just some statistics for where it is now. Um, right now, there are about 1,700 uh, repositories that have been built with Binder and turned into images. Um, and we're getting about, like, about 400 deployments on an average day, and that goes up and down a lot. Um, some, some days there are really big spikes, like if there's something cool on Twitter, um, and other days there are fewer. But this is, you know, this is, tends to, this is what's average. Um, and then 
we're collecting a lot of data because people have built lots of binders. This is really old. This is back when we only had about 300 uh, binders built. But it's kind of cool. Just, I just wanted to show what kind of analyses you could potentially do on the data that we can collect. We could see just what kind of common packages people install or what requirements files, or sorry, dependency files people are interested in. Um, and like I said, we can also make a cool word cloud like this that shows you know, which packages most people use. I think this probably wouldn't be surprising to anybody here. Um, these are all in the binder base image because you know, in every environment that's built with binder, we include Anaconda right now. So, um, so now actually getting into the examples, um, binder's just been used for a really big variety of use cases. Um, I think, so the, the first one that like, we really wanted to target was pub publishing, so reproducible analyses that go alongside academic publications. Uh, and so this was a binder that was built uh, alongside um, uh, a person, a postdoc, um, a joint postdoc between Jeremy and Carl Soboda at Genelia named Nick Safranyev. And he released a paper in eLife about, um, you know, a, about neuroscience and the mouse cortex. Uh, and alongside of it, he took all of his analyses and he put them all into Jupyter notebooks. Uh, he organized them really nicely and has two different notebooks, one where he takes his raw data and converts it into data frames, and then another where he takes those data frames and turns them into figures. Uh, and then built a binder out of it and put a badge right here and then announced this alongside of the paper. Um, and I think this whole, this whole process is still very new, um, but uh, it, you know, it, it kind of, it, it highlights some of the cool things that you could do if you had interactive publishable documents um, that could potentially be peer reviewed or published alongside journal articles or maybe even replace some journal articles. So we're kind of definitely interested in exploring how, how Binder can be used to enhance publishing um, in this way. Um, and then also, this was definitely one of the coolest examples we've seen with Binder. So with the LIGO data release, uh, both uh, Kyle Cranmer and Min uh, converted the Jupyter notebooks that were released with the, uh, with the uh, announcement into Binders. Uh, and this was really, really popular. They announced it on Twitter. It got tons of launches. Um, it was really fun to play with. I think that this also brings up an interesting point, which is that you know, most people that launch the LIGO Binder are not going to know much about high energy physics, and so they're not really going to be able to manipulate the data in any meaningful way. Like, you know, I would, I would change the color of some figures and stuff. But, um, but the point is, you know, at what point would this be considered useful? Well, if, I mean, if one or two people can get into a binder and actually extract some useful information by tweaking parameters, um, then I would say that, that that's successful. So that's, that's the important part. Of it. Um, and this is another uh, really cool example that I like a lot. Uh, I think I, I misspelled the, uh, the URL, so I'll change it later. Um, but CERN uh, uses Binder a lot to showcase tutorials for this uh, root analysis framework that they have. Um, and this is a really cool Binder because they have um, this C++ kernel that's interpreted. It's just, it's kind of crazy. Um, it's just, this, it's a really big software project. And um, CERN has some really interesting use cases for it. Um, we actually set up a Binder internally at CERN because they want to, they're thinking about ways um, in which it could be used to kind of showcase internal data releases a, a little more effectively. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. I'll talk a little bit more about the custom deployment at CERN um, in a bit, but um, that was definitely um, a really cool experience. Uh, and then this one, I just, I, you know, it was a little bit out of left field. Um, some uh, Berkeley folk just came and put their whole textbook into Binder, uh, and now you can just go into all the notebooks. It was a notebook-based te textbook, and you can go in and, and just play with it right there. Um, and it just goes to show that, that the platform is kind of Pretty, pretty broad and can be used for a whole variety of things. Um, so now I kind of just want to talk about, um, I have this combined section on FAQ, what's new, future directions, and I'm just going to sort of go through all those things uh, in what's hopefully not a jumbled mess. Um, so the, the very first question that everybody asks um, when hearing about Binder is, where does the money come from? Because uh, we're supporting this really big public cluster. Well, it's not really big, but you know, we're supporting a public cluster. Uh, and uh, it's coming out of, uh, out of Jeremy's uh, lab budget. Um, Genelia happens to be a really cool place in that they give their lab heads just lots of flexibility on what they could do with their resources, and this was considered to be a worthy cause for that. So Binder is maintained as a public service, or as a public utility, and, uh, but it's a fairly small deployment. Um, so, you know, so it's available um, for, with a certain number of slots, and the slots aren't particularly large, and we sort of try to try to keep it as available as possible, um, but you know it is a small deployment. So then that sort of naturally leads into the question of can I deploy it myself? You know what if I have real avail availability concerns, or you know I have custom hardware requirements that aren't satisfied by the public cluster? Can I or I want to use private data? Um, can I deploy the system myself? 
Uh, and so I want to use that to kind of lead into uh, Binder 1.0. So you know, since we released Binder, it's been you know really in beta, uh, and now we're sort of saying we're sort of transitioning into 1.0, which has a whole bunch of new changes. Um, it was basically a complete rewrite. Um, it's you know, all the standard things that are good. It is that. And then, but the important thing is it prioritizes custom deployments. Uh, and so I think this is sort of important for, you know, the, the growth of Binder is that people who really have special requirements up from it can set, up, set it up on their own infrastructure or modify it to sort of fit what they need out of it. Um, and so this is something that we, that we really wanted to emphasize, really wanted to put a lot of work into to make it pretty easy and straightforward to set up your own deployment. Um, also, the one box without any options, that turns out it's really, really important, not just for user experience, but uh, because we don't require any authentication, if people went to a binder and rebuilt your binder with different options, they could break like a binder you'd previously built. So it's not really, you know, when it comes to reproducibility, it's hard to make any guarantees. So now that's far better. Um, also, if you use a custom Docker file, we give you a variety of base images to choose from now if you want yours to be a little bit lighter, a little bit faster. Um, lots of UI changes and a docs page. Uh, so the docs page, I have a link right here. I'll post a link to the slides uh, after the talk, but the docs page, oh, yeah, hi. Um, when you're custom deployments, do it allow us to use other uh, GitHub git client repositories or custom git uh, right. repositories? Uh, right now it's still all GitHub, uh, but part of the rewrite was to make it more extensible to add different sources if you want. Um, so that's definitely something that if you're interested in doing or anybody's interested in doing, like we'd appreciate the contribution. Um, but yeah, so far, it's only GitHub. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have a nice docs page now that goes through uh, just the whole process of from a user, how do you use Binder, what does Binder do, and then also from a developer, if you want to contribute, what's the best way to do that? Um, and now I just want to talk a little bit about custom deployments. Um, I already said why they're useful for, like, for resources, for, for availability and special hardware, um, but now I just want to show a little example of, of what they, uh, they look like. Um, so part of, uh, part of Binder is we wanted to provide this Binder control module uh, that wraps all the other Binder components. So all those different bits that I, I showed you in those, cartoon, those little cartoon illustrations uh, are all controlled by this one module, Binder control, and it has a little prompt that will tell you, that will ask you which parts of Binder you want to launch and which parts you want to leave you know, and use your own services for. So if you want to bring your own database or bring your own logging stack or bring your own cluster, you can do that. Uh, and Binder will selectively start up different parts depending on what you want. So we're trying to make it pretty flexible to, to use in whatever environment you, you have. Uh, and then another question we just get asked all the time is, uh, what's the best way to access data? Uh, and the answer to that is there's, you know, it can be pretty tricky and there's no uh, really good way to do it, uh, or, or no ideal way to do it. Uh, one, one good way to do it is to put some uh, just like downsampled data into your GitHub repo and just use that for your demos. Uh, another way to do it is if your data is all public, you could just put some of it on S3 and then load that in. Uh, but we definitely say if you're going to use the public cluster, don't use any private data or put any private keys into it um, just because we, you know, we're not going to be uh, responsible for any like security issues with that. So, <laughs> so generally, private data or public data only, uh, and if you want to, if you, you, know, you can use S3 for that. Um, another thing that is actually starting to take shape now, and we've talked about it for a little while, um, is this collaboration with the DAT data team. So what DAT is, it's uh, a JavaScript-based kind of um, data syncing system, version controlling and peer-to-peer and -peer, uh, sharing and data syncing system. Uh, and, and it's really cool. Um, it can be used to generate a hash out of a data set that you can then include in your repository, and that will sort of version control the whole environment and its dependencies. Um, the reason, or, sorry, and it's data dependencies. Um, and I think the reason why this is valuable is just because you can imagine having a GitHub repo and then up modifying the data on S3. Well, if you build a binder out of the GitHub repo, you no longer have something reproducible because you've had this, you have this unmanaged dependency over there. So the idea is now you can actually bundle the whole data, well, hash of the data set that can then be used to sync the whole data set um, from within the binder. Uh, I also think that that is, uh, is really useful for, um, for on the deployment side of things, and this is something that I'm currently exploring. Uh, Binder has a pretty big limitation right now that like, if we want to get instant boot of images, uh, you, uh, you need to preload the image onto the cluster nodes, and when you have 1,700 big images, uh, that becomes kind of painful, so we don't have much elasticity uh, and, and can't adjust to demand nicely. Um, so I think that introduces a really cool opportunity of actually um, 
pulling in the layers of a Docker image dynamically as they're requested if you have a really big Cedar node and a lot of peers with a lot of bandwidth between them. So I'm kind of trying to think of ways to sort of have a more lightweight, more flexible cluster that um, will, will also be easier to maintain and cheaper um, if there's no usage. So I think that would be kind of a really nice way of doing that. Um, and now I just want to say, just kind of wrapping up, that everything is MIT licensed and all open source. Uh, we have this chat room here and uh, that tends to be pretty active. If you have any issues with stuff, just post there and we'll try to fix it. Um, and then also the binder project GitHub has lots of examples in it and all the source code for all those modules that I talked about. Um, and definitely uh, we welcome contributions uh, and we'll try to get anybody set up who wants to help out. Um, right now there aren't too many uh, contributors on the project and there are definitely, there's a really big feature list. So if anybody's interested, um, come talk to me or come jump in on the chat room. And uh, now I just kind of, I want to have a lot of people to thank. Uh, I just want to thank Jeremy and the Freeman Lab for a lot of support, all the Jupyter people for lots of ideas um, and, you know, and, yeah, and original inspiration, and then HHMI and contributors, web reporters, all the usual suspects. Um, and thank you guys. So, yeah. <laughs>
yeah, there's still a lot of conversations to be had, but no, we haven't actually tried any of that yet. Um, yeah, if you have ideas, <laughs> definitely. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks.